Dr. Nick Whitley is a senior scientist and chair for the Fishery Science and in Emerging Technologies program at the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life at the New England Aquarium. He received a BA in biology from Albion College in 2000 and went on to receive a master's and PhD in zoology from the University of Hawaii. Nick's most recent work has focused on the use of accelerometers and other modern electrics to study fine scale behaviors in sharks in the wild. He and his team have used this technology to study shark mating behavior and energy expenditure and to determine whether and how sharks survive the stress of being caught and released by fishermen. Nick's accelerometer work has expanded to other animals, including several species of sea turtles, fish, and pythons. Nick currently resides in Cincinnati, Ohio, is in, and is in residence at the Newport Aquarium in Newport, Kentucky. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you all for coming. I'm always impressed with my ability to draw a, cl a crowd when uh, attendance is mandatory. It's <laughs> fantastic. So understanding the secret lives of sharks is a, a challenging thing to do. And that's because if you think about it, we can never really observe them directly. Um, in order to see what sharks are doing, we need the, the most perfect conditions. We need crystal clear water, a bright sunny day, and we also have to attract them up to the surface with some kind of bait or chum. And so if you think about it, they're not behaving naturally when we see them like this. So even the most devout Shark Week viewers among you have probably never seen a shark engaging in natural behavior. So in order to study their natural behavior, we have to use a number of uh, technological advances that I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Uh, but first, for a lot of us, our, our image of sharks probably comes from uh, the book and the movie Jaws. And as a kid growing up in Michigan, that's what I knew of, of sharks. And I'd seen this movie as a kid, and it terrified me. So uh, on our family vacations to the ocean, I refused to go in the water. I, I stayed up on the beach uh, playing in the sand. As, as I got older, I played a lot of uh, beach paddle ball and uh, did a lot of bird watching and walks on boardwalks. The only thing that prevented me from being teased for not going into the water was just my indomitable fashion sense. Uh, no one could ever make fun of a, of a kid like this. So yeah, it was pretty sweet. But as I got older, I started to try and learn about sharks. I started reading about sharks to see if there was a way that I could figure out how I could go in the ocean with my friends and relatives and not get eaten. So the more I read about sharks, the more I learned what fascinating creatures they were. And I became kind of a shark nut. But other people saw the, saw the movie Jaws and came to different conclusions. Uh, they came to the idea they, that these sharks were really a, a dangerous threat and that we should fish them and, and catch them and kill them as much as possible. The idea that the only good shark was a dead shark uh, really became a, a popular opinion in the 80s and 90s, and uh, shark populations started to decline. That's what was happening here in this picture. This is at, in uh, Hawaii in the early 1990s, where the state of Hawaii was actually uh, killing sharks. They were, they were funding uh, these expeditions that would go out after someone was bitten by a shark, they would go out and kill as many sharks as they could in the, off the beach where that uh, bite had taken place until uh, science came into play. There was a group at the University of Hawaii who decided to tag these sharks and track them. They, they attached these tags that sent out a ping, an underwater ping, that they could follow the sound of that ping from a boat. And when they track these sharks, this is the island of Oahu here, and uh, the different colors are just different depth contours. But these lines represent tracks of individual sharks. For 24 hours or 48 hours, they would follow the shark and see where it went. And they found out that almost every shark they tagged within the first day or two would be hundreds of miles offshore, or maybe even closer to the next island over. So they really showed that this idea that you could go out to a beach where there, a bite had taken place and and kill the culprit shark was just completely erroneous. And based on that research, the state finally stopped with that practice. Uh, while they were doing this work at the University of Hawaii, I was using the same kind of technology on a species called nurse sharks in the Florida Keys. This is when I was an undergraduate at a small school called Albion College, but there was a professor who was studying sharks in the Keys. And so I was actually uh, applying these acoustic pinger tags, the exact same 
technology, exact same tag that was being used on the tiger sharks, except I didn't have a boat that I could drive around to follow the sharks. I had to paddle a kayak. And I had on my kayak, I had this underwater hydrophone here on this PVC pole that I'd stick in the water and turn and listen for the sound of that tag. And if I pointed in the same direction, in the correct direction, the ping would get louder and I would know that's where I had to paddle. I thought this was the greatest job in the world. It, it, it turned out it's really kind of the grunt work that they have the undergrad interns do because you're just paddling all day long uh, for, for days at a time, which gives you some pretty good arms after a while. It's, <laughs> I, was, I was selling tickets to the gun show there. Um, but doing, doing this work made me well qualified to, to go on to the University of Hawaii and, and track sharks there for graduate school. So after I did my four years at Albion College in Michigan, I, I went to graduate school at the University of Hawaii and immediately started working with them on their tiger shark project. So Hawaii is a great place to study sharks. There are a lot of tiger sharks and that you can catch them very close to shore. We would catch them on, on hook and line and bring them up alongside their boat and roll them over onto their backs, whether they go into a sleep-like state called tonic immobility, which is incredibly convenient if you're a shark researcher because you can do all your measurements and tagging and they just kind of lie there. And then we'd even get in the water with them uh, when we released them. This is, this is actually a picture of the largest tiger shark ever measured by scientists. It's 15 feet, one inch long. And uh, you can see we, we caught it out of a 17-foot boat, so it was literally almost as big as our boat. Um, and I was, I'm, I'm very proud of this, this picture, although I almost became the most famous shark researcher ever uh, by accidentally swimming directly into the mouth of this shark after I took this photo, which would have been probably the dumbest way that any shark researcher has ever died. Um, <laughs> And, and, it, and it would have been most likely fatal to swim into the mouth of a tiger shark because they can do things with their mouths like this. This is uh, what, what had been an eight-foot shark that we caught on our line, and by the time we pulled it in, there were only a couple feet of it left. Uh, you can see this nice, clean, semicircle bite here that a larger tiger shark took out of this animal. And if I were to give you a, the sharpest fillet knife in the world and you tried to cut through their thick, uh, tough skin and, and muscle tissue here, it would take you hours and quite a bit of effort, and uh, another tiger shark was able to do this pretty easily. Uh, but fortunately, we never had any problems with the sharks. We were able to tag them and then get in the water and release them, and they always just swam away. They just wanted to get on with their lives. But for my dissertation research, I mostly focused on a smaller species, the white tip reef shark. Uh, this is a shark that can actually rest on the bottom. Many sharks have to swim constantly in order to bring water into their mouths and out, out their gills so they can breathe. These sharks can rest on the bottom, so you can actually swim up to them and approach them and take pictures. Uh, I did that same acoustic tracking that I, I'd done with other species, except with the white tips, we actually put the tag, the acoustic pinger, internally. We did minor surgery and made a little incision in their abdominal wall and put the tag in there. And then I would track them. They gave me a boat this time, so I didn't have to paddle a kayak around. This was also, this is the early 2000s. This is when digital cameras uh, Believe it or not, people didn't have smartphones back then, but we had these things called digital cameras that everyone was just now starting to take underwater with them. So that meant we were able to use photo identification. You can see these markings on their side. Each shark has a unique marking, like a fingerprint. So we were able to use photo identification to track which sharks were hanging out in which caves and how long they were staying in an individual cave. And the other thing I studied with them was population genetics. So in order to do that, of course, I had to get DNA from the sharks, collect a tissue sample. And to do that, I had to figure out how to uh, get a tissue sample from a shark without catching it, because white-tip reef sharks, it turns out, are, are pretty hard to catch in Hawaii. So um, I developed these biopsy tips that we put on the end of a spear gun, and then I would go around and find a shark, and well, I'll just show you. I've got a video here. This is me diving down. Like I said, these sharks like to hang out uh, under coral caves and ledges. So I would swim down into the cave and uh, find a shark. You should see the shark here in a second. If you watch closely, you should be able to tell the point where I take my sample. There you go. And so then I would retrieve that. Uh, I would retrieve the tip of that spear, and it would have a little plug of tissue on the end. And uh, the sharks would heal very quickly, and they almost always swam away, just like you saw that one do. Um, I would also collect samples using something called pig ear notchers. These are used on pig farms. 
Think of it like a, a paper punch, except instead of punching a hole in the paper, if you were just sort of to punch a triangle out of the outside edge, uh, we can do that actually with the shark's tail. We, f we find them when they're resting on the bottom, when they're sort of asleep, and we can sneak up on them and, uh, and collect a tissue sample. And if that, if that seems like you're, you're asking for trouble, you would, be, you would be right. I did get bitten uh, by a shark doing this, but still have all of my fingers and thumbs. It's totally my fault. Um, if you want to hear that story, maybe come to the Q&A after this. Uh, so after, after that, I was finally done with, uh, I completed eight years of graduate school. So that's four years of undergrad, eight years of graduate school. If, if the seniors here can be considered to be in 12th grade, I was basically in 24th grade by the time I finished uh, all of my schooling. And, uh, and so in, that was in 2009 that I, I finished, finally finished graduate school and got a real job at a place called Moat Marine Laboratory in Florida. So we moved across the ocean. By that time, my wife and I had, had two kids. And uh, we had to say goodbye to all of our friends in Hawaii. Fortunately, we didn't have to say goodbye to our friend, Mrs. Borkin, because she had left the year before. We had already said goodbye to her. But um, it, was, it was once I made this move and, and got a job that I started using this, this other technology that I still use today called accelerometers. So whether you know it or not, most of you probably have an accelerometer, maybe even on your person right now. Uh, because they're found in most modern electronics from digital cameras to your smartphones. You know how when you're looking at a picture on your phone and you rotate the phone and the image rotates so you're still looking at it upright? It's because there's an accelerometer in your phone that's detecting acceleration from the Earth's gravity so it knows which way is up and which way is down. Uh, like it's also this exact same chip that's found in a lot of uh, video game controllers like the Fitbit or the Wii, sorry the Wii. And it's the same one found in the Fitbit instead of it, it actually tracks your steps because it's tracking the movement, the acceleration in your wrist. So these same sensors were now put in uh, these brand new fancy tags. And I got my hands on one of the first wildlife tags ever made that had an accelerometer in it. And I decided to test it, like any good scientist, on my kids. Um, so. This is the first video I had made with my accelerometer tests on my kids, but now I have more kids, so I made a new video. Um, and if you can just take a look at these three kids, uh, see if you have, they, they actually have tags on their, on their feet here. And so I just took our, sh our shark tags and tied them into their shoelaces, and I did all three just to be fair, and also because I wasn't sure which one was gonna follow instructions the best. Um, but, but these are our tags, so now I'm going to show you a video of their movements. And just looking at the three of them, I mean, see if you can figure out which one followed instructions the best, um, just from the looks on their faces. I can tell you it's the middle one. <laughs> just keep your eye on the middle one, uh, because the movement of his foot is going to correspond to this data down here. So uh, in the beginning here, you can see he's mostly holding still, and we get a flat line in acceleration data. And now he's taking small steps, and you get small spikes in acceleration. And then in a second here, he's going to freeze. There he goes. At least, at least the foot with the tag is frozen. Um, and so you get a flat line again. And now you can see we have some bigger spikes that are going to come in a second. There he goes. So now he takes bigger spikes, and you get more acceleration. Yeah, he's dabbing. And then. He holds still again, you get another flat line, and you can tell something really exciting is about to happen here. So when he really gets after it, you get the biggest spikes in acceleration. <laughs> so you get the idea. So a lot of people, when they hear acceleration, they think that we're, we're measuring the speed or the velocity of movement. Acceleration is not velocity. Acceleration is a change in velocity. So that's why we get a, a spike for each, each step. Um, and that is the same thing we get when we tried it on our first sharks. We tried it on those white tip reef sharks in Hawaii. And you can see we would get spikes when the animal was swimming and a flat line when they rested on the bottom. This doesn't seem like much, but this is actually a huge advance in the technology because when I was tracking my white tip reef sharks with my acoustic pingers, I would never know if the shark was just sitting right under my boat doing this, resting on the bottom and breathing, or if it was engaged in some amazing feeding frenzy 
uh, and moving around like crazy, but just staying on the same reef. If I was just tracking it with that acoustic pinger, all I would hear is the ping that told me the shark was nearby, whereas the accelerometer gave me uh, the chance to really know what the animal was doing. So after decades of tracking where sharks go, we could now suddenly track what the sharks were doing. I want to take this technology back to my old stomping grounds in the Florida Keys and use it to study a more interesting shark behavior, mating. Uh, shark mating takes place in the dry tortugas in the Florida Keys. It's the only place in the world where you can observe shark mating behavior on a predictable basis year after year in clear, shallow water. Shark mating involves a number of interesting movements and postures that are very different from a shark's normal day-to-day -day life. Uh, the males have to actually grasp the female's pectoral fins so the sharks can get close, and the male has to insert one of his paired claspers into the female's cloaca in order to fertilize her eggs. Uh, that's, that's code for sex. Sharks have sex. Um, and it looks like this, and, and just in case, uh, so here's a male grasping the female's pectoral fin and inserting one of his claspers. Just in case anyone was drifting off to sleep, I'm gonna show you a video of what this looks like. So here's a male shark grasping the female's pectoral fin. And right now they're just, they're just court, this is just courtship, but then they actually get to the point where this is a successful copulation. In a second you'll see, as they pan around, you'll see a clasper actually inserted there we go. This is the clasper. Male sharks have two claspers because they have to rotate one forward and across their own body in order to use it. So they have to be able to be on either side of the female. And then they finally decouple there. So that's what a mating event looks like in sharks. Uh, a great thing to study with accelerometers. Thank you. Wow. That has never happened before. Thank you. Um, the, the, problem, the problem with these tags, well, one of the great things about them is they record so much data. They record about 100 data points every second. But the downside of that is that it's too much data to transmit back to us via satellite or through some underwater receiver. So all the data are stored in the tag, and we have to actually get the tag back from the sharks in order to get the data. So to do that, we've designed these custom-made floats, and we attach them to the shark's fin with a, with a uh, galvanic release that corrodes in seawater so that the tag can ride on the shark's fin for a while and eventually release and float to the surface and we can get it back. I'll show you a little more about that in the video in a second. But the nice thing about the dry tortugas is we can not only tag these sharks with accelerometers but then we can swim around and observe them directly so we can see what they're doing and then correlate that to the data from the tags. So we're not just guessing on what the tag data means, we've actually been able to validate it. So for instance, We've, from our observations in the shallows, we know that shark swimming behavior looks like this. You get a spike for each tail beat as they swim around. When they're resting, of course, it's a flat line. And if, but I was, I was interested in looking at, at more complicated behavior like these mating events. And we know, because we've observed our tag sharks mating, that uh, just the raw acceleration data mating looks like this. It's, it's very noisy, but we can actually filter this data and separate it out into something called static acceleration, which gives us the animal's body posture. Static acceleration is what I talked about. That's what your phone is using to rotate the image up or down. And then we can also filter out into the dynamic acceleration, or the acceleration that's due to the animal's movement. And that's, that's like what your Fitbit is using to, to count your steps. So we can very easily see in the data, even just the raw data, when these mating events are happening. So here's an example of a shark that mated three times in, in one day. And obviously this one mated multiple times over, over the same period. So overall we found out that most of the mating was taking place during the day and most of the mating events were fairly short, just a few minutes. Uh, but the next step was to, to look at a, a different question that we could, we could, how could we use this technology to uh, study something that was relevant to sharks in a, in a fisheries uh, status. So for instance, a lot of shark fishermen now have gone to catch and release fishing. Very few people are still catching sharks and killing them and bringing them up and hanging them up on the dock to show off. 
Uh, that's a good thing. Catch and release fishing is excellent. But the assumption that all the sharks that are released are swimming off and living a long, happy life isn't necessarily true. Um, I, by the way, I would like to uh, thank Headmaster McMullen for sharing this picture of himself uh, fishing for sharks with me. Um, I'm just kidding. It's not really. <laughs> But I'm going to show you a brief video on how what we actually do go out with the fishermen on the boats. Uh, to, they reel in the shark and then we put our tags on. Sharks that are caught and released by fishermen, how many of them actually survive? To do that, we're using these acceleration data loggers. They're accelerometer tags that record every tail beat the shark makes. These data loggers combine the depth, the pitch, and tail beats so that Nick and his team can tell when the sharks are swimming down, swimming up, if they live or if they die, a technique that's never been used to study the sharks off this coast. So here's the process. They first catch the sharks, and then on them put an accelerometer and float package. So when we roll them over like this, they go into a sleep-like state called tonic immobility. Ideally, they just totally zonk out and hold still throughout the tagging process when they're like this. It doesn't always work. This thing starts corroding in seawater as soon as it gets wet, and eventually it allows the whole strap to come off, and the tag releases from the shark's fin and floats up to the surface. And once it hits the surface, this radio transmitter starts sending out a signal that we can hear from up to about 10 miles away. It's even more fun when, when we put these tags out and then we have to go out and look for them and get them back. After 24 to 48 hours, the team now has to recover a whole bunch of floating tags. Okay, so we basically drive around in a boat with a big Yagi antenna. It looks like one of those big antennas that everyone used to have on the top of their house uh, before you were born. And we, uh, we listen for these tags and we, we actually get them all back. Um, when we do get them back, we look at the data and for this study we were focusing specifically on black tip sharks caught on rod and reel in Florida. And when we get the data back, we first generally look at the depth and so our, our tags also record depth data. We usually see all of these spikes where the animal's going down to the bottom and coming back to the surface over and over again. This is a common swimming pattern in sharks. And then when we look at their tail beats, we see the same thing. We see lots of spikes showing that this animal was swimming along, doing just fine. This is a shark that survived. But sometimes we see a different pattern. So uh, we'll get the data back and we'll look at the depth and it started out going up and down in the water column, but then the depth kind of levels off down here, and when we look at the tail beats, we'll see that it started out swimming, we get tail beak spikes, but then eventually, when it, once it hits the bottom, tail beats go to a flat line and all movement stops. This is how we know that the shark died. This is a, a dead shark that, was, uh, that died from the stress or injury sustained during catch and release. The good news is, um, we found from this study that most of the sharks survive catch and release in this fishery. We had about 90% survival and only 10% that didn't make it. So that's good news and, and says a lot for catch and release fishing for this species, that it's probably sustainable. Based on our success in that study, we've now taken that to different shark species in different fisheries. So for instance, uh, we work with commercial longline fishermen now. These are guys who go out in big boats and put out lines often three to five miles long with hundreds of hooks to catch as many sharks as possible. And some of those sharks are prohibited species. They're not allowed to actually keep them, so they'll, they'll release those animals, but only after they've been hooked and fighting on the line for, for several hours. Um, we, yeah, so we'll work right with the commercial fishermen. We'll bring the sharks up on the boat, attach our tags quickly, and turn them loose. This is several species now we're working on. Tiger sharks, uh, bull sharks, black tips, a couple species of hammerheads, spinner sharks. And when we look at our preliminary results from this, we can see that uh, our mortality rates are very different depending on the species. So these are very low mortality rates here, two to 8% for sandbar sharks, tigers, bulls, scalloped hammerheads. But other species have much higher mortality rates. Black tip spinners, great hammerheads can have between 42% to 70% uh, post-release mortality. So these are animals that are, are dying at a high rate. Remember our black tips, when we caught them on rod and reel, only 10% of them died, but when they're caught on long line, 42% of them die after release. So a big difference there and shows the, the important need to do this kind of research on every individual species and fisheries to really make sure they're properly managed. 
So getting a little closer to you all geographically, I've also had the opportunity to tag some white sharks off of Cape Cod in Florida. And this is, this is working with a group called OSEARCH who has this giant ship where they have this hydraulic lift that they actually lower over the side of the boat into the water and they lead a shark up over the lift uh, so that they can actually bring these giant white sharks out of the water to be tagged. Uh, give you a little look at what this looks like. This is the video you're going to see here is actually from a white shark that was nicknamed uh, Lydia and caught off the coast of this one was actually Jacksonville, Florida. Um, all of these sharks have now become pretty famous on social media. They have Twitter accounts with thousands of followers. Uh, Mary Lee, Catherine, these are some of the famous, the most famous ones. Lydia also became pretty famous. Uh, but you can see the sh shark is caught on hook and line from a small boat and then it's led back to the big ship. Not towed because it's constantly swimming on its own, they just lead it. Um, and then as they get it close to the ship, they bring it around right over the lift and it swims onto the lift and they give the signal, whoop, they give the signal to lift it up out of the water and then once it's high and dry, uh, we put seawater hoses into the mouth to keep the gills irrigated so the animal can breathe and then all the scientists jump on board and work sort of like a NASCAR pit crew, applying our tags, collecting samples, doing measurements. Um, there's a, a satellite tag that they're putting on. There's my orange accelerometer package that will stay on for a, a short period. There's the seawater flowing into the shark's mouth and, and keeping the, the gills irrigated. We put a wet towel over their eyes because that seems to keep them calm for some reason. And then once we're all done, the lift is lowered back down in the water and we release the animals and they swim off and, uh, and we get the data. Here's just a couple still photos. I mentioned Mary Lee, who's probably the most famous shark we tagged. She was about 16 feet and uh, nearly 4,000 pounds, so, so bigger than most of the cars parked outside for sure. Um, and so from our accelerometer data from these, from these sharks, a, another glimpse into the secret lives of sharks, we see they do this, if you look at the depth data, they do this movement where they swim from the surface down to the bottom and back to the surface over and over again. But when we look close at their tail beats, we can see that when they're swimming from the surface down to the bottom, they actually stop swimming, they're gliding. Uh, and they have to then start tail beating again when they go back up. This is called swim glide behavior. And we think it's probably an energy conservation strategy. If you imagine being a shark and you have to swim every second of your life from the minute you're born to the minute you die, not nurse sharks and white tip reef sharks can rest on the bottom, but many of these sharks cannot. They have to swim constantly to breathe. Uh, it makes sense to figure out a way to rest once in a while. And so that's what we think is happening here. They may even be sleeping while they're gliding down to the bottom. And then finally, these uh, satellite tags are the last little bit of technology I'll talk about. These are mounted up near the top of the dorsal fin. And then whenever the shark swims up to the surface and, come and brings this tag out of the water when there's satellites overhead, we can tell where in the world it is. We don't have to follow it from a boat anymore. And so you get these amazing tracks. This is the shark you just saw that was tagged off of Jacksonville, ended up crossing the mid-Atlantic, and at one point was, was closer to France than it was to Florida where we tagged it. Um, Mary Lee, who we tagged the, off Cape Cod, one of her first things she did was cruise down here and went right past Bermuda. Uh, the book that I showed you that I was reading when I was a kid says very clearly that white sharks don't go to Bermuda. Mary Lee had not read that book. <laughs> she, went, she went straight there. So for the, for the kid who grew up, you know, terrified of Jaws and, and unwilling to go in the ocean, it was, it was pretty cool to be able to actually uh, tag these big white sharks that, that were the basis of, of the fictional movie and book, Jaws. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to wrap up by talking a little bit about science in general. I know probably most of you will not necessarily go on to be scientists. Some of you, I hope, will. Um, but for those of you even that are not going on to be scientists, I wanted to explain a little bit just about the, this process of how, we, how science works and what we have to do to publish papers. So, for instance, here's, here's a paper that I published from my grad school work on white tip reef shark population genetics. Um, you can see we published it in the scientific journal. They even put a picture of our shark on the cover of the journal, which for a scientist is like really exciting, even though maybe the number of people who will actually ever read this paper is probably fewer than the number of people in this room right now, but that's, that's how it works. But 
Um, a lot of people probably think that we do these studies and, and send these papers into the journal and then they publish them and uh, that's how the science works. In actuality, after we do this, I spent about seven years collecting tissue samples and doing the work for this paper. And I wrote up all the data and wrote up the paper and I sent it to the editor of the journal. And what happens is that the editor sends it out to uh, some anonymous reviewers, usually three, sometimes four. And these are people who I, I don't get to know who they are, uh, other than the fact that I know they don't send it to any of my friends or anyone that I've worked with before. They almost always send it to people who are experts in the field who are my competitors. They're competing with me for, for grants or sometimes for jobs. So they have every incentive in the world to try and poke holes in my work and, and find the flaws. And that's exactly what they do. They go through it with a fine tooth comb and they write their review of what I've done and then they, the editor sends me the reviews and I have to go through and respond to every single comment they've made. Sometimes it's dozens, sometimes it's over a hundred. And for every single one of those, I have to either make the change they're suggesting and admit that they're right or I have to defend myself and say why I think they're wrong and that I should be able to keep it the same way that I wrote it originally. So I write my response to those reviews and send it back. And then the reviewers get to read my responses and pick those apart. And they also get to read the reviews from their fellow reviewers that they didn't see before and, and see if they agree with what their other reviewers said. So this whole process, only after that whole process goes on, sometimes it goes back and forth a couple times, then the editor will make a decision about whether or not the paper will be published. This whole process can take six months to a year, often longer, and sometimes at the end of that, you're left with nothing. You've just done all this work and they've rejected it, and you either have to go back to the drawing board to fix the study or submit to a new journal. Um, and so all of this happens before the paper's ever published. This is before you ever read an article in the newspaper about a, a new discovery that was made in science. So I think that's just, it's an important thing uh, for everyone to know when you hear uh, people refuting things that, that are, are a scientific consensus. So it's not that, I'm not saying that scientists are perfect or that we know everything, but that we're committed to this process where uh, we're trying to find the holes in our own work before we ever, before we ever publish it. Um, so a, a famous physicist, Richard Feynman said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. Scientists are just as easy to fool as anyone else, but we've committed ourselves to this process to find the errors in our, in our assumptions. So when you hear someone, some politician or a cable news host um, say something where they're refuting some scientific consensus, ask yourself if you think they've gone through the same process that the scientists have. Now, are there mistakes that will come out in published scientific papers? Absolutely. But the only way we find out about those mistakes is from more scientists doing more work and going through that, that process again. It's not just from someone spouting their opinion on, on cable TV or something like that. So we're living in a world now where the truth and science is under attack from multiple fronts. And we're starting to lose track of some basic scientific consensus here that uh, that should help us, that we should know about. So for instance, vaccines are safe and save lives. Man-made global warming is real. Uh, mermaids are not. <laughs> uh, Megalodon is extinct. These are all things that, that there's no debate about in the scientific world, but there is debate about in, in the uh, political and, and public world, worlds that you all are inheriting. So even if you're not a scientist, I hope that you will all uh, be able to graduate here and think like a scientist and question your own beliefs and the beliefs of others. And uh, with that, thank you.